Thank you very much, Andy, for this kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to open. Is it working now? It's a great pleasure to open this session with a talk on forests and biodiversity, which is certainly a very broad topic and it's hardly can be covered in 10 minutes presentation. So I can only focus on a few aspects here. So, <clears throat> not working, sorry. Okay, so you know, all know that forests in Europe have been heavily influenced by humans for more than 5,000 years. And this resulted in a change in tree species composition, so mainly a shift towards uh, fast growing conifer species, a reduction of structural richness in our forests, in particular deadwood, tree related microhabitats, and others. And it also resulted in a darkening of the forests, mainly because of the transition to high forest management and the increasingly used of single tree um, selection forestry. And what we also observe, of course, is that many species are threatened by extinction nowadays. So, and this loss of biodiversity seems to be ongoing. So this is an example from the Biodiversity Explorators where we found that um, in the last 10 years, the arthropod diversity declined on the, at the, uh, on the regional scale as well, as well as on the stand level scale. So to, to mitigate or to halt this biodiversity loss, we have to better understand what drives the biodiversity in forests. And beside other aspects like climate change, so Jörg will focus on that more in the next talk, and also influenced by agriculture, also forest management uh, can affect biodiversity in multiple ways. So based on ecological theory, there are three major pathways how forest management is linked to biodiversity. First is through uh, resource and habitat availability, for example, deadwood amount and microhabitat availability. So it is assumed that more resources sustain a higher abundance and also a higher diversity of consumers because rare species have enough resources to persist beside the common species. And this affects biodiversity. So the next is resource habitat diversity. So Management affects tree species diversity by focusing on mainly a few economical valuable trees and also by affecting heterogeneity and environmental conditions. And we expect that resource diversity provide more needs for species and so also enhance biodiversity related to the resource heterogeneity hypothesis. But then also microclimate is an important factor. So forest management affects canopy openness, for example, and we know that insect metabolism is temperature dependent. So temperature is seen as a major driver of biodiversity in insects. All this also affects ecosystem processes that are related to biodiversity. And we also have to consider that all these effects can be scale dependent. So in the following, I will show you a few examples of these different aspects. The first is resource habitat availability. So here in this study in the biodiversity exploratories, we enriched deadwood on the ground level and also in the canopy, in spruce and beech stands. So what we found is that independent of the stratum and independent of the forest type, the experimental enrichment led to an increase in biodiversity. And also this is um, <clears throat> confirmed by a meta-analysis across many different studies that found that saproxonic species are promoted by deadwood enrichment and also on average non-saproxonic taxa. So habitat resource availability is the main driver of biodiversity in forests. So what about resource habitat diversity? I want to show you here an example also from the biodiversity exploratories where I exposed logs of 13 different tree species in a total of 30 different forest stands of different composition in three regions of Germany. And then we collected the emergence, emergence of the beetles from these logs with these eclectors. So what you see here is that with increasing number of tree species considered, we increase the biodiversity. So also tree species, biodivers uh, tree species diversity is not only relevant for herbivores, for specialists, but also for subroxylic beetles. We have to take into account that particular species like Harpinus in this case can have exceptionally high biodiversity and need, this needs also to be considered 
in management strategies. So the third one are the microclimatic conditions. So this is another experiment in the Bavarian forest where beech and fir logs were exposed under shady and sunny conditions. And it turned out that microclimate is the major driver of the composition and diversity of the species of the saproxylic species in this experiment. So they found that the abundance as well as the species richness of saproxylic beetles is higher under sunny conditions. And we find a very distinct community under sunny conditions compared to shady conditions. So each dot here represents a community on one plot in one year. So these, the microclimate here as a canopy openness was the main driver of this community composition. And because we have different communities under shaded and sunny conditions, also uh, it is important to provide both sunny and shaded habitats in our forest. So now to scale dependent effects, I will give you here an example of two management systems that are managed at different spatial grain. So the even aged and the uneven aged management system in each forest. So we don't have clear cuts in Central Europe, but we have even aged shelter wood systems where a cohort of trees is growing up and then replaced by another cohort of trees. So we have a low uh, <coughs> structural heterogeneity within the forest stand. But if we look at the landscape scale, because of the stands of different age classes, which provide different environmental conditions, we have a high heterogeneity. In uh, contrast, in uneven aged forests, where young and old trees grow next to each other, we have a high structural heterogeneity within forests. But if we look at the landscape scale, we have quite homogeneous conditions. So very dark forests as a, and a large scale. So what we know is that if we go from large scale clear cuts to small scale clear cuts to shelter wood systems, we can increase biodiversity. But it's not clear what happens with a single tree selection system that uh, acts at a small spatial grain. So it is uh, advocated by policy and also going to conservation, but it's unclear. So we don't have much evidence that it really promotes biodiversity. So I want to show you say, uh, our results of about 15 different taxonomic groups that we considered and also different diversity levels. So the past studies mainly focused on the alpha diversity level. So for example, the number of uh, species that we find in one forest, but we also have to consider that in the different forests, we might expect different species. So also the species turned over among these sites might contribute largely to the regional biodiversity. So here you see the results, uneven aged relative to even aged management system for the different groups. So bars to the right show higher diversity in uneven aged forests, bars to the left, higher diversity in even aged forests. So su surprisingly to us, uh, despite this high vertical heterogeneity, the alpha diversity was only higher in uneven aged forests in birds. And if you look at the species turnover, most species responded positively to the even aged management system, which we, uh, <clears throat> translated also to a higher diversity, regional diversity in this even age managed system. And this is not related to, disturb, uh, um, to disturbance indicators or uh, open land species because forest specialists uh, responded in a similar way. So this uh, points out that the environmental heterogeneity at the landscape scale between the different stands is a very important driver of biodiversity in our forests. So the question arises whether combining these different management systems could enhance biodiversity because we have different species compositions in the different forest management systems. Therefore, we <clears throat> looked at the gamma diversity at different proportions of even aged, unmanaged and uneven aged forest, forests in the landscape uh, by <clears throat> varying in 10% steps, the composition at the landscape scale. Sorry? Three minutes left. OK, thank you. Uh, at the landscape scale, and what you see here is the re diversity response surface. So it's stronger, it goes to the green color. The higher is the multi-diversity in this case, which is the average proportional diversity across these 15 different 
taxonomic groups. So the major result is that we have the highest diversity in landscape that are uh, only uh, comprised by even aged management forest stands. If we look at different taxa, we found for most taxa the same picture, but for some taxa, like for the birds, we found that they profit from a, a small proportion of unmanaged forests, and with that with fungi even preferred a landscape only comprising of unmanaged forests. So this stresses the value of unmanaged forests, but we have to consider here also that the unmanaged forests that we studied here are still very young, and this is the case in most unmanaged forests in Central Europe, so they haven't developed this valuable, valuable structure that are important for biodiversity. To conclude, uh, habitat amount and diversity as well as the environmental heterogeneity, especially at large spatial scales, promotes biodiversity. And it has been shown that habitat amount in most cases is even more important than the spatial arrangement of habitats. And this <clears throat> leads to the conclusion that all these aspects have to be integrated in forest management, mainly by promoting that within microhabitat structure. We also have to think about actively promoting it, because if we take a forest out of management, there are still structural, poor in structures, and it takes a long time until disturbances will enhance these structures. Promote tree species diversity, because it's important not only for specialists, but also for uh, subexotic species, for example and promoting environmental heterogeneity at landscape scale, and especially the early and late successional stages, the stages that are more open and that would rich, they are very rare in our landscape, but very important for biodiversity. And there, we could also make use of natural disturbances. So Jörg will focus on that in more detail to <clears throat> enhance the contribution of these uh, important stages. And by doing this, we might also, also these very demanding species might survive in our landscape, which uh, <clears throat> depend on a long continuity of, uh, of habitat availability of large deadwood amounts and that survived in some forest patches and can then spread into the managed forest landscape. So by doing so, we hope that we can avoid such a situation and uh, mitigate the biodiversity loss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for this very interesting presentation. I'm now looking on the Q&A. There is a question coming in from Irem Tufet-Chioluklu. Sorry for the pronunciation. Um, and he asks, do you have any question, Martin? Do you have any, any silvicultural activities, activity plans for unmanaged forests? So are there silvicultural activity plans for unmanaged forests? I don't know if there, there are plans, so I'm not from the practice, so I don't know exactly what, what they're doing. But of course, there are different methods that you can, uh, can apply. Uh, here are, are some of them, of course, you can, um, Create that with structure by different methods, by, for example, girdling trees, by bombing tree, blow up trees, uh, or heading trees. So there are some research projects going on that test how um, how species diversity will respond to all these measures. But we don't have uh, detailed results now and can't say what is the best way of promoting biodiversity in these cases. Okay, thank you. And there is another question by Sebastian Kreparochas. So he asks that you mentioned many effects of forest management on gamma diversity. And the question is, should maximizing gamma diversity be the goal for biodiversity conservation? Yes, of course. I mean, it doesn't, if you only enhance the biodiversity at the local scale, you don't consider that there's a, a lot of species turnover because of different environmental condition at the landscape scale. And if you really, your aim is to promote, uh, to promote and, and uh, to protect biodiversity at a national scale or at the regional scale, you have of course also to consider these different environmental conditions that enhance biodiversity. 
and therefore gamma diversity at a larger landscape scale. Sorry, I'm just looking for another question. No, I have found it. Okay. There is, that's the last question for Martin. So there is a question by Susanne Winter. And sorry, just a moment. He, she asked, how do you assess the value of decay phases and gaps and regeneration phases within the natural life cycle. So how do you assess the value of decay phases and gaps and regeneration phases within the natural life cycle? I don't, don't fully get, get the question. I mean, how do I assess that from a methodological perspective or the influence on biodiversity? So the forest life cycle uh, includes open and sunny phases that are different yeah. from shelter wood structure. And the exactly. question is now, how do you assess the value of these phases? I mean, we, we assess the value of the different management systems. And the system include all these different phases, either at a very small spatial scale, like in the, uh, in the uneven aged forest or at a, at a larger scale by having different stands with the different phases. And it seems that it needs a particular size of the of the openings that you really have an effect, a positive effect on, on biodiversity. And by combining these, these larger scale open areas with, this, with the dark areas, you can enhance biodiversity in total because you have different species composition in these open and, and closed phases. But in the selective cutting system, you have very dark forests. So you miss these open stages. 